Hi everyone, welcome to FinTech Walkabout, where we're exploring the world of FinTech and open banking at the moment. I'm joined by Alex Barkley uh, from HSBC Ventures. Alex, it'd be great to just get a, a quick intro from yourself. Yeah, thanks. As you said, I'm, I'm Alex Barkley. I'm the uh, Head of Strategic Partnerships at HSBC Ventures. For people who don't know, we're the central innovation function at HSBC. We do early stage tech investing, we build propositions from scratch, and we work with third parties to try and accelerate the bank's innovation agenda. I've been with HSBC for four years or so. You were there before, right, as well? I was. I've done a couple of different things there. Yeah, I used to I used to be an investor, so I used to run our VC portfolio for a few years. Um, and before that, I was, I like to joke, the most hated man in fintech. I was the bank's global head of fintech procurement, which was trying to bridge the gap between small companies like AppTap and the big, hairy organization of HSBC. Not always successfully, but the idea, I think, at the time was to try and find ways to bring some new ideas, new ways of thinking into, an organ into the organization. Yeah. Has that been successful, you think, over the course of your That's a good question. Years. That's a good question. <laughs> I think the landscape has changed a lot, in, in, in certainly in the four years that I've been in HSBC. When I started, the narrative was very much around, we were still kind of exploring and you were still starting to see some of these big startups coming to maturity. I think as that's progressed, the, the, the thinking has really changed. And I know from, I, I can speak for us to say that we see so much opportunity in this space. I think when you look at what we are able to deliver and what we are able to kind of build ourselves, it makes complete sense to be doing that with third parties and finding ways to work with them more, you know, and I think you see that trend in other organizations as well. You see, you know, Standard Charters partnership with Starling on their mm. Green Bank. You see, I mean, your partnership with, with TSB. So I think we're going to see more and more of that into the future as banks become, big banks, big FIs, become more aggressive in this space. You see Chase UK being very prominent now. Yeah. And I think we're, I said to somebody the other day, I think we're starting to see a real sea change in the way that FIs are trying to deal with big challenger banks, you know, the likes of Revolut and Monzo. So I think it's going to be an exciting time to be in fintech in a big bank. It has been an exciting time, I think. Maybe the excitement has been subdued a little bit thanks to kind of open banking's push. This is a specifically an open banking yeah. focused conversation for the most part. We'll get into kind of what excites you, what you're focused on, but we've seen this and, and there's a couple of questions in here I've tried to ask everyone. But we've seen this massive transition now from kind of traditional methods of data sharing, whether that was kind of user led or screen scraping, into what we're looking at today in terms of, kind of open banking APIs. Obviously, there was a lot of well, there were a lot of mandates put on on banks to deliver, especially the CMA nine. How has that kind of evolution shaped your kind of partnerships, investments strategy? Yeah, completely. And I, you know, if I go back again to, to kind of four years ago, I think open banking was touted. And I've said this said this in public before. That I think you know, open banking was touted as being this massive thing that was going to revolutionise finance. That yeah. it was going to enable customers to access huge amounts of products. And you know, I remember talking to somebody again. Like, four years ago about what the bank of the future looked like, a kind of front door of a big organization into a variety of different services that customers would be able to access this huge ecosystem and marketplace of solutions. And I think if I look at where we are, dream. say yeah. again, a man can dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think where we are now, I guess I'm speaking for myself here as a user of open banking products, that I don't think mm. we've seen that. And I don't think it quite lived up to the hype it, it had four years ago. Mm. I think if I'm being critical of it, I think there's a lot of a lot of good ideas, but I think we've really not seen it scale beyond, especially retail banking. Yeah. I think there's so many interesting applications of the technology in, in, in commercial banking. Um, especially with SMEs and the way that SMEs needs are changing with some of the regulatory changes. I think for us, our open banking journey started, uh, HSBC started four years ago when we made a minority investment into BUD, who now deliver open banking products, open banking transaction aggregation into our first direct proposition for over a million of our customers. I think we're really proud of that. I think what we would like to see next from, from, from the industry is a kind of step beyond that. So yeah. I'm not actually, as a user of open banking products, I'm not massively interested in being able to see transaction aggregation and classification, sure. right? I'm a Monzo customer for my primary bank account. Yeah. And I think you've become to expect that level of service. Everybody kind of has that now. Yeah. And what I think we're yet to see, by and large, and I'll give you a good example in a minute, of we, we've not seen that next stage of it. So I remember I also have a Revolut bank account, yeah. mainly for, for test purposes. Yeah. And I, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe 18 months, 12 months ago, I signed up, they I had a Premier account, 
and I signed up to insure my phone. I got a brand new iPhone, it cost like a zillion dollars. And I was like, I need, I'm really uncomfortable, I'm really bad at dropping phones. So I was like, I need to insure this. Or really good at dropping phones. You know, I thought it would be, you know, I'd come to expect the proposition to be really slick. The app is very good. And I pressed on it and I was thinking this is just gonna be like, it'll pre-populate the form yeah. straight through. And it was a horrible experience. <laughs> it was really bad. And I guess from looking at what I expected to see from them as an organization from where they are now, that for me is a really simple use case of open banking. Yeah. You know, being able to pre-populate that information, being able to do something meaningful with it. And you know, I haven't tried to do it in a while, but I'd love to see those types of products that mean I can meaningfully access those, ty those types of solutions. I'd like to see people meaningfully adopt sure. those. Certain company springs to mind when you talk about it. Yeah, I mean, this is that's right up our alley, right? And mm -hmm. I totally agree and resonate in terms of how that actionable layer just needs to be built out to kind of improve that user experience. And we'll get to a question at the end around how successful you think open banking has been, but maybe let's talk through it a little bit more before mm. we get there. It's been clear though that the big banks are or have been kind of tied down, let's say, for lack of a better expression, with, with the infrastructure build. So is that, we're at the tail end of that now, would you say? And, and, and is the kind of like action a customer can take the, the next piece for you? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, the challenges that, that big FIs have is that it's slightly older infrastructure, the slightly way, way in which systems have evolved. And I think most organizations, certainly the similar size to us, are on that transition journey. You know, yeah. I think there's been a recognition a few years ago that more investment was made in, was needed to be made into, in, into their core digital propositions. And I think you can look at any big bank's reports and see that commitment there. You know, Jamie, Diamond came out, you know, a couple of last month and said that he was going to spend twelve billion dollars on modernising their tech stack. Yeah. I think most of us are in that that kind of space, and I think. I think now you have that, and in a way, maybe you didn't a few years ago. I think you have that foundational layer of infrastructure that's ready for these types of technologies to be integrated for it. I think you have a maturity in the solutions in the market. Most people are now using some kind of, you know, like TSB and you or us and Bud. You know, I think most people are now using these types of technologies. So the maturity in the market is there. I think the customer appetite is there. I think you look at the the squeeze that we see, I think, in retail banking in general, you know, I think people are looking for more from their accounts. With the rise of, you know, embedded finance, everything's a fintech all of a sudden. And sure. I Thing we need to do but you see every like that's this is probably a conversation most banks are having mm -hmm. right it, internally or even externally at the moment and you know not all of them are going to be able to do it okay. yeah look i think I think part of it, as I was going to say, I think part of it is driven, being driven by customer expectations. I think the simple, sure. people, simple, you know, people, people simply want to see these products and they want to see more coming from their banks. I think you know I would be surprised. I would be shocked if most banks weren't thinking like this. And you'd like to think, given the amount of investment dollars that are going into these, I think most people should be able to deliver something in what form that is, I think, yeah. will, will be, remain to be seen. But everyone's looking to be this kind of super app, right? And that's, that's where this leads to, is this kind of like WeChat style. You can do everything in one place, and your finances kind of operate as this core... Yeah, I think that's certainly the that's certainly the narrative that you hear from a lot of people. Yeah. I'm maybe a little bit more skeptical. I'd like to see I think everybody's got opinions on it. You've seen the rise of Revolut and you've seen like those I think which is probably the the broadest comparable to a super app we have in the West. I think you see WeChat obviously emerging in, in Asia and people like Gojek and things like that in Southeast Asia. I think I'm I'd like to see more customer data on it. And I think about my I can talk to my own experience that you know, yes, it's nice to have some of those services in, 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 in an app. I just want to see more concrete, and I haven't seen it. I haven't seen more customer behavioral data. That's actually what they want. That would seem to be the narrative. Yeah. But actually, you know, if a big bank was to offer something like that, is that necessarily what their customers want them to be offering? I'd need to see more information and more data on it, I think. Yeah, I think the, the way we're looking at it is kind of a user experience piece. Is that a bank incentive piece? Or is this even like a merchant kind of like infrastructure play, right? We've seen a, a lot of kind of like the the headless commerce, Shopify, mm. and so on coming through and raising a shitload of money and yeah. building some really cool stuff. But how does that translate into user experience? How does that translate into this kind of super app style? I think the other thing probably to add here is there's, there's an element of trust, I think. I was reading an EY, um, EY report on trust in financial services institutions. They've done a load of surveys. And, you know, I think I'd be interested to see how, you know, big banks, big organizations, trusted brands, you know, like HSBC, can really use that trust and that, you know, I'll be really candid, 
I don't trust some of these other brands out there. I don't trust if I'm going to click somewhere, is it going to sell me something that I necessarily want? And yeah. I don't think I'm unique in this. Don't necessarily feel that about big FIs, you know, because of the regulatory scrutiny relation, re regulatory scrutiny that we have. So I'd be interested to see how big banks play in that and leverage that into the future. Yeah. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's an interesting take because I think from our experiences with with CSB and some of our other partners has just been, well, obviously we're a small stage company, right? The level of diligence and that has been kind of next level. So it's, uh, for us, we're, we're always, maybe that's an app tap thing. We're always trying to take that approach of, kind of what can we do that's best for the customer? Don't, mm. don't just kind of puke deals at a user. Let's try and get to the crux of what matters. But it'd be good if you've got kind of some, well, whatever you can tell me, some first-hand kind of experiences. And, you know, you mentioned Bud already, but those mm. relationships that you've built at HSBC around the kind of open banking piece. Yeah, I think, I mean, the Bud, the Bud piece, I think we've been, you know, we've been a, a big partner of theirs for a long time. We worked with them, I think they were in the FCA sandbox at the time, and I think we identified a need very early, I think, about the kind of adoption of, any, of open banking. And we, I think we made a decision that we wanted to bring that into the first direct um, portfolio I want to say about 2018, 2019. And we were really looking at the time, I think, and probably and still are, how we could bring that vision that I articulated at the start of the conversation, you know, that like that marketplace, that open, yeah. that open suite of products into, you know, in, into First Direct or, be, or, or HSBC. Yeah. And I think we saw that it was primarily being driven by customer needs. So rather than building 20, 30 user journeys ourselves, hard coding them into our apps, which is quite a difficult thing to do within a big organization. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that we could connect out to this universe of new services. Um, and that was very much the vision that was driven behind it. We made an equity investment in, in, in Bud a few years later, about, about a year later, I think. And we signed you know, a long-term agreement with them to, to bring that service into First Direct. So I think we're now at a stage where you know, that, that agreement's been implemented. We have that kind of foundational layer. And I think, look, I'm, I'm not actively involved in the conversation anymore, but how can we grow and how can we, we scale that use case within both the First Direct brand and the wider HSBC piece? Okay. I think, you know, that, I think that was our big foray, certainly in the organization, part of the organization that I sit in into open banking. Interesting. So, I mean, you know, throughout our series, we talk to regulators, we talk to TPPs, we talk to fintechs, banks, mm. and so on. And everyone's got their own little kind of microcosm that they're operating in. And I imagine your role sees a pretty broad scope of the things that are happening across open banking. You talked about you know, what's going on in retail versus mm. SME versus kind of freelancer, you know, propositions. But what is it today, open banking today? What what's the thing that kind of gets you? going gets you most excited yeah i'm you know and i think we talked about it you and i were at a conference a couple of months ago and yeah. you know i kind of talked about it then that i'm really interested in not only bringing those those products that make it easier to our customers and i'll use the example around being an sme we had a, a project a few years ago that some folks went into a street not too far from here and went and spoke to, to, to the to the customers uh, sorry to the to the guy who owned it was a cake shop and he was like tell us what would make your life easier and the guy was like, I don't want to fuck around with like any of this business stuff. I just want to make cakes because yeah. <laughs> that's what I, that's what he was excited with. And that's what he wanted to do. And I think the thing that gets me excited and passionate is a, like, how do we bring those things to people? How do we offer mm. a differentiated service and how do we bring that brand and our banking products into the heart of their business in order to help them in order to better free them up to bake cakes or be a freelancer or whatever they want to do. I think the second thing that I'm really interested in, really passionate about, is how we can use open banking to open up accessible finance. So I think I look at areas like the work that the that the, some of the, that we've done with Bud around making essentially renting, being able to put rent into your credit file. Right? Sure. Yeah. You know, how do Rep we reporting? And, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly right. Into into into, <clears throat> cre into credit into credit agencies. I think for me, you know, I'm interested in how do we help more people get access to the right types of finance products, be that mortgages, be that unsecured lending. You know, for me, I, I'm not a big proponent of BNPL, like be pure BNPL, the way that Klarna and I think some of these other companies in the US, like Firm, have kind of aggressively gone after, and I'm speaking for myself here, yeah. you know, have kind of aggressively gone after that kind of market share. I think there are more that, that kind of big banks can be doing to get into that space to help and safely support our customers. I think mortgages is a really interesting one. You know, for me, I'm 35. I found it very difficult to get a mortgage, right? You know, I probably earn a, earn a reasonable amount of money. Yeah. And it still was really challenging the hoops that you've got to go through to be able to prove affordability. 
I've been renting in London for five years. You know, like why? Like, like why would you pay think my I rent would... here? Yeah, exactly, exactly <laughs> right. But I think you know, and you know, I think about how complex that mortgage process is in general. The process of buying, not mortgage process, the process of buying houses. Yeah. That actually, if you could just streamline some of that and make it a little bit easier for people to get on, a to get onto the, the property ladder, but b to make that process a little bit smoother and a little bit less stressful, I think that would be massive for customers. So I'm excited to see anybody, you know, doing that in that kind of in that doing anything in that kind of space yeah might have a couple for you and chat offline yeah. but it's definitely a, a step-by-step kind of iterative process right mm. but what you're talking about is you know open bank has laid this foundation where do we go from here mm. do you see open banking then as just this like well we've got data insights and then we've got payments right mm. so this is we've got a two-part thing here that's uh really just just getting started to your point at the beginning and then what you're starting to talk about is like already what comes next as opposed to you know are we are we ready to move on to that or is it very much we have to bolt these things on to prove this kind of value so we can take the next step because i mean open finance what's after that and that's the question i'll ask later but yeah and I'll, i've got a good answer for you there yeah. as well I, yeah i look i think you have to be looking at the real value and i think you know, taking a step back from open banking and thinking about <clears> solutions in general, whatever problem you have to solve, be solving a, pro- a customer need and yeah. a customer problem, right? And I think the ones I articulated are the most obvious ones. And I think the way in which, you know, probably diff- slightly different from a, differently from a fintech, the way that these decisions are made in big organisations are very, very data driven and very, very financially driven, right? So, if we're going to invest X in implementing the solution, what is the ROI on that? And yeah. I think having those clear I think it's simply it's it's not simply good enough to say this is an aspirational thing we want to do. That I think there needs to be a really clear return. I you know I'm just talking about decision making in yeah, yeah. organizations, right? There needs to be a real strong commercial reason for wanting to do that. You know, and I'm, big organizations have a thousand different problems, and of that thousand different problems, you can deal with you know 99 on a different on one particular day, one particular year. The rest of all this kind of stuff sits in that what well, is that nice to have? And yeah. I think. If you can do, you can address a clear customer need, you can make a process slicker and you can make a process cheaper for an organization. I think that becomes a very, very powerful business case. And I think to Double bring that- done a lot of the kind of opposite, right? Up, up front, at least. I, th- I think you're right. And I guess where I was going with that is I think if, I think we're now at a stage where we've done the hard work, you yeah. know, people have done the heavy, people like you folks have done the heavy lifting. Where do we go? Where do we go next, right? And how do we- and how do we how do we make these genuinely meaningful for both our customers and for ourselves? Okay, what were the kind of big challenges associated with cost? Obviously, um, you're dealing with regulators, but you know we're looking at the SEA, which is arguably one of the most, let's say, forward thinking regulators in the world. I think both of those kind of things. I think we've already talked about the kind of technology side of things. I think, like most regulators, most all big organizations, rather, I think there's a certain amount of inertia and a certain amount of prioritizing things within organizations. I think you have, with any, I think there's maybe a misconception of what life is like in a big organization, that there are only a finite amount of people to do things. You know, and I go back to their, you know, even if there are 100 things that you need to fix, you'll only ever get to 90 of them. And actually, how do you bring some of this stuff and this change up the queue? It became a regulatory requirement. I think that's probably why mm. the government forced banks' hands to a certain extent. So I think there was probably an agree of inertia within big organizations kind of getting started. I also think, you know, I, I guess connected with that was a lack of kind of engineering talent, you know, kind of like, how do we actually do this? Like, how do we actually make this stuff available and, you know, meaningfully connected into our infrastructure and things like that? And I'm talking in, in general generalities here. And I think lastly, with all new regulation, I think there's organizations that are not particular, are particularly risk averse, right? We, we take our customer responsibility really, really seriously, yeah. go back to the trust piece, right? That So I think there's always going to be a degree of hesitancy when looking at this and trying to understand it its entirety before we kind of acted. Okay, so it's uh, another step-by-step step process. Yeah, look, and you know, as much as I might wish it or as other people might wish it, that you know, working in big organizations like this, there are, it's a step-by-step process. I might want to click my fingers and say, you know, let's transform this particular process or this particular part of the organization. The reality is things don't happen like that. It's one step, one step forward. You take sometimes take a few steps back. Yeah. But we've taken those preload and fire off. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> but you go, you know, to go back to the go back to the, the the piece around open banking, I feel like we've kind of taken those kind of first couple of steps. 
I think people are kind of comfortable with it. There's clearer customer needs for it. I also think we can talk about it. what does open banking, open finance look like as opposed yeah. to open banking. But sure. I think there's a ton of opportunity there that maybe that people's vision for it didn't exist four or five years ago. Yeah. So I guess that kind of leads me into, are you making the most of it today, would you say? Or how has, on a more granular level, how has open banking from in your role changed how you do things like your due diligence or, or your investments? Or is it not quite there yet for I look there's always more that we would like to yeah, well, I, well I, yeah, I think there's always more that we would that, I, that always you can be doing right yeah. and I think as much as I or anyone else would want it organizations like ours are never going to be on the bleeding edge of this that yeah. we tend to be a little bit more thoughtful and a little bit more cons- you know a little bit more what's that I'm thinking of conservative in our approach to these kind of things like I said the things that I think we're missing out on or think that big organizations are missing out on we've already kind of talked about a little yeah. I'd love to see some of the things you talked about looking at taking customer like taking things like due diligence data whether that be for making minority investment or whether that be for looking at a commercial loan a commercial client for a loan i'd love to see some of that coming through and those you asked me kind of what what do i think what, what it gets excited gets me really excited is those kind of applications yeah. for it because i think stepping out of the retail space into the into that commercial into the commercial commercial space is really where a lot of opportunity lies and where i think we probably could be doing more okay and so that's that's obviously then part of a more holistic strategy how is your how have your experiences so far in in the realms of open banking combined with the kind of regulatory pressures that are coming through how has that started to shape what the next three to five years looks like for for the organization yeah look i wouldn't say that you know you use the term regulatory pressure i don't think it's, there's so much as a regulatory pressure is that look, we all recognize the need to do this and we all recognize the need to make the was that the same statement three to five years ago you think <laughs> I wasn't making those decisions. <laughs> I wasn't making those statements three to five years ago. Look, I don't think it doesn't feel like regulatory pressure. I feel like certainly from from where we are in the organisation, I feel like we are now looking for that next like next re, that next stage of things. And like I said, we've had a lot of conversations in our team about look where does this go next? We have a portfolio company in this space, but also as active investors, what do we see? Where do we see the kind of next sets of opportunities come? You know, and we kind of talked a little bit about them before. I think as an organization now, you know, we are as I think things become a little bit easier. We're looking at could we do this ourselves? You mm. know, at, you know, I think some of the pressure maybe and some of the constraints that we have maybe isn't necessarily the where it was five years ago as we become more. I think the recognition that we become more digitally native, whatever cliche we want to use, <laughs> right, is it, as that becomes as that becomes easier to get things done internally. Maybe there's more of we will look to do inside. But yeah, I haven't really got a good question answer for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, that's, that so that's owner, that's ownership, right? Mm. By the sounds of it, is the kind of key theme. And then, who the, the the players who are owning these experiences today are the ones who are commercializing them, mm. right? I mean, Buzz doing it, we're doing it. There are plenty of other players we could mention. Is that I don't know? You may you may tell me to to shut up or stop asking these questions, but <laughs> is that something that you ex, you see HSBC exploring as kind of the commercialization of, of various APIs or, or data or insights? Uh, yeah, look, I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer it at a very high level. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> look, we take our customer, the customer's trust, and we talked a little bit about that earlier, right? Yeah. I think we take that incredibly seriously. And I think, you know, one of the, I think the last, one of the things that we do have, rightly or wrongly, I think is that, customers trust right and i think that there is a probably a fine line between commercializing that and being doing things to the benefit of your customer offering them new services offering things that genuine value add mm-hmm. and i think there's a there's a there's a there's another path that you could take and i think we certainly have no interest in doing that as far yeah. as i can see yeah. i think for us it's more about how do we offer use these technologies how do we offer a deeper suite of products be that our own suite of products or they be third parties right so I think you're seeing a move away from banks potentially offering these type of things into more of a subscription-based revenue and on fee-based revenue, right? That's a very broad theme across the industry. You can listen to, you know, 10 bank CFOs talking about that when they do their quarterly reports, right? And I think that's where I see the um, a lot of the commercial opportunity in it, right, is if we're not going to offer somebody access to that particular type of product, but actually when we have no interest in doing so, but actually our customer need is there, how do we how do we bridge that gap between the two and potentially make some money off it? I don't see us, you know, if you're asking me, do I, are we ever going to commercialize our data? I, I don't see, you know, from the space that I sit in the organization, I, I, I don't see that happening. Okay. No, what you're talking about is, is what Amanda's Revolution mm. doing, right? Is like how do we ring fence some 
additional value adds behind a monthly fee, which is a basic subscription model at the end of the day. Yeah, look, I think as there's as there's increasing pressure, and I mean, maybe it ties into the open banking conversation, that I think there's increasing pr- pressure on interest rates. You happen to see the interest rates, what, like half a percent at yeah, the moment, yeah. down from, you know, like 10 years ago, whatever it was, right? You know, for us as banks who, you know, make money, I, I don't see that, I don't see that pressure going away. And I think a move away from interest towards fee-based revenue is, like I said, is a massive theme. And I think... You know, tying back into that with people wanting more from their more from their banks. You know, like I pay for a Monzo premium account. I pay for a Revolut premium account. I don't think I pay for the Revolut. What, one what anymore, do you get but, back? Though, well, exactly, yeah. exactly right. And is it is it worth it? You know, if I'm paying whatever it is, fifteen quid a month for for a Monzo premium account, am I getting the real benefit from that? You know, I do it because I wanted access to a couple of a couple of particular types of products. You know, I wanted access to their. Experian credit reporting. I wanted access to their. I really wanted a shiny metal card as well. <laughs> really, what it was. But I, I think you know that that you know going back to the conversation about open banking, right? I think it ties into. I want more out of my customers. I want out of my account. I want more access to these kind of features. And you know that's the Revolut model, right? So it was a it was an FX account yeah. that you paid for. I remember hearing a story three four years ago now that a guy needed to move money to buy a mortgage to buy a property somewhere in France. I think. And it was cheaper for him to get access to a premium interest rate by being a, being a Revolut premium customer than it was for him to send the money via Western Union or wherever he was going to send it, right? Yeah. So I see that that type of growth, you know, you take that kind of that principle and apply it across the board. Like more and more people are going to want to do that. And I think it's an interesting way to see how that current account market changes, right? It's expensive by and large to run current accounts. How can we generate more fees and more revenue? But we're in a special place in the UK, right? Where we're not charging for current accounts where no. a lot of consumers think, oh, my financial experience should be free or free. I, I think that to a certain you look at, look at the Australian market. I think I'm right in saying that the, the Australian market, there's much more of a prevalence for paying for bank accounts than mm. there, is, there is here, right? And I think it's then, you know, how do you add those features onto there, be they, you know, FX, be they, you know, access to other kind of products. Insurance, for one, I think is a really interesting one, yeah. you know, and I think how you then start to drive insights contained within those accounts, I think is hugely valuable, right? This, so, you know, this like... Is open finance, right? This exactly, open exactly right. Needs. Exactly right. But I guess it's then, like, how much ownership do banks have over that experience or, or that kind of handover and, and, you know, you've got your own financial products to, to worry about. Is it worth you know, you switching a customer to a different financial product? I think it would, I think it depends on the product. Yeah. I think, you know, and it depends on, you know, an organization's appetite to play in that space, right? So if you're a big insurance provider, of course, you're going to want to own that customer. There may be types of risk or there may be, you know, types of product that you don't want to offer or yeah. there may be ways in which you can offer it in a better way to the customer. So I was thinking about, I remember hearing, you know, and I'm not saying any, I don't, I don't know anybody doing this, but looking at, things like data contained in mobile phones so you know if my you know there's a lot of shock data i drop my mobile we talked about earlier right <laughs> i drop my mobile phone all the time that data is contained somewhere within the the data on my device, on my yeah. device right could that be used to give me a better premium right we see it in car insurance right you get your little black box from whoever the insurance provider is you drive like a, you drive safely you get a lower premium right those are the types of things you can look at what is contained within data within current accounts you know like to serve up that interesting and that tailored that genuine like personalized yeah. finance products because yes. i think i think that's where i think that's where banking is going i think we're moving away from this broad like mass market types of proposition into more niche tailored tailored types of offering you look at the rise of you know what rob and billy are doing with daylight in the us catered to lgbtq plus people or you know there's a huge host of these types of organizations doing very tailored things and i think that's probably i think that's probably where i see banking going you know like trying to go so broad and wide that you well, get the, nobody because that was my point earlier right around like not everyone can do it and you'll end up with you know some interest, super interesting businesses mm. as you just mentioned there's a company called expo that's working on you know, like influencers specifically. How do we mm. get from like invoicing and, and banking flu- for influencers, which is a growing niche, let's put it that way. Um, I think, I, you know, I think it's, I'm really interested in freelancers, for example, right? Yeah. For people who, you know, who have be you, I don't know, or like you, you work in the gig economy, right? If you're an Uber driver or you're an Amazon warehouse worker, right? 
your needs are different from somebody like me, right? Yeah. You know, I don't, you know, I hope I don't need income insurance or anything like that. But for somebody who has, for example, a fluctuating income, you know, actually, wouldn't it be great if you could do something to smooth that, smooth that out, to make yeah. that more predictable? What about if you were able to take data around maybe out of some of these companies' core systems? Like, could I offer somebody a mortgage based on their Uber driver rating? Right? Yeah. Is there a correlation? So, then it's, you know, how do you start to share that information? You, you talked about car insurance, right? Mm. And they, they are, these insurers are sharing databases between them to understand kind of risk premiums. But then, you know, how do the outsiders like us get, get our little hands on, <laughs> you know, how many times you crashed your car this year so we can... <laughs> <laughs> give you a better quote. I think I go back to, you know, as a kind of principle of things I was saying before, right? How can you solve problems for these organizations? There is that kind of mutual exchange, right? It's yeah. not, you know, at the end of the day, however, how big organiz- organizations in general are here to make to make money, right? Yeah. You know, it's just the nature of what we do. And I think finding, I think the success in, you know, be it what you've just said or anything else, right? It's finding that middle ground between the two. So it's mutually beneficial to both parties, whether that's some kind of revenue share, be that some kind of joint venture. Like you see more and more of those really kind of more innovative agreements between organizations these days. So uh, Look, to, to give you a very high-level answer to the question, I suspect it's probably somewhere in there. Where's the mutual advantage between yeah. small companies like yours, bigger insurance companies, for example? Like, Where's that mutual benefit between the two? Yeah, well, that's the age-old question. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, the question everyone's asking, uh, at least in, in our realm of things. Um, conscious of time, so a couple of like kind of quick-fire. It's been 40 minutes not already. So, not so <laughs> quick-fire. I know, right? Um, I guess what we've alluded to is value throughout, well, maybe not even alluded, just blatantly called out the fact that there needs to be customer value. Does it matter whether a customer needs knows what open banking is? No. I think it's more about delivering those products in a seamless way. You yeah. know, So I think when we're having this discussion in the office this morning that for me, more and more as people become and the world becomes increasingly dominated in tech, right, I can remember... You know, life before you know, like dial-up modem, right? I can I can remember my first mobile phone, right? I think the younger generation coming through, and I think people as people become more accustomed to those types, that ubiquity of digital experience, right? Nobody cares how the pipe, we don't care how the sausage gets made, right? Yeah. I just want to see the end. I just want to see it. I mean, you guys yeah. do, right? But <laughs> I, I want to see that product at the end. You know, I want to have that seamless experience. Go back to that experience I had with Revolut and that insur- phone insurance form. I have become accustomed, even at the ripe old age of 35, right? I have become accustomed to that being a seamless experience, you know, like one-click checkouts. Yeah. I want that experience across my digital land- that's, that's life, right? An interesting one actually it's one quick checkout is something that we've kind of explored a little bit and we've seen the likes of like fast and ball mm. stripe kind of well at full force towards one click checkout but we found is actually kind of like holding the customer's hand through that mm. has been has just proven better conversion kind of like this is what's going on here are the terms and conditions associated with that in a really simple format you know we outline what data you're going to commit and yeah. you know, can we, what value do we bring back to you and, and having three or four steps is actually proven. I think it depends on what you're buying as well, right? Yeah. You know, if I'm buying, if I'm spending, you know, £40,000 on, I don't know, whatever, a yeah. big amount of money on something, I don't want to feel like I've just pressed it and that yeah, money has just disappeared. I don't yeah, know what I'm doing. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Amazon Prime, right? You know, I just, I just love it. Just I click and it's done. I don't yeah. want to have to fill out a zillion forms. I don't want to have to go and Let's find trust, my card. Right? Goes back Com- completely, you know. And I want to be able to. I think there's more about convenience as well, mm. right? I trust them. I know that I've had that interaction way too many times in that money I spent on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. But I want to have a, you know, I want that. I don't want to have to go and dig out my wallet to find my card number. Like I don't really carry a wallet anymore. Yeah. I don't know really know where it is. Like. Something as simple as going and digging out a card number is a pain, right? And I think having that convenience within reason is really useful. If I was going to drop a ton of money on something, I'd probably want it to feel a little bit more structured. Yeah. I thought you'd be carrying around that metal card everywhere. I'd... So you kind of uh, beat around the bush on this one at the beginning without me asking, open banking, success or failure if you had to choose right now? Oh, it's too early to tell, right? And I, I'm, not trying, I'm, not, trying to, I'm not trying to I'm yeah. not trying to dodge the question. <laughs> I think he says. Has it has it <laughs> has it lived up to what I thought it was going to be five years ago? No. Okay. Do I see it getting there? Yes. And do I think that the principles that that that, that people talked about back then? Do I think that they're still valid? Yeah, absolutely. Do I think they're more valid? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, 
maybe. Great. Well, it's been a real pleasure. What's um, what comes next for for Alex and for HSBC Venture? How much are you allowed to tell me? You can give me the the confidence. Yeah, look, we, I think we've we've got a bit of a new strategy. You know, we have we've had some 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 new new people coming in. So some new people coming in from. You know, the first time we've hired some people from some challenger banks, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Look, we've got a lot of we've got some how the tables have turned. <laughs> <laughs> we've got some really cool stuff going on. I just say, kind of watch this space. You know, I think we're we're very we think we've come to believe that there's a lot of talk out there in the world, and I think we really want to deliver and put something really valuable in our customers' hands. So Brilliant. watch the space. If I'm watching the space, where what is the space? Where can we find you? I mean, you can find us on our rebranded HSBC Ventures website. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find me on all good social media, and yeah, or in a basement of a building somewhere yeah perfect well alex thank you so much and no problems that's it for this episode of, of fintech walkabout alex been a real pleasure and join us next time thank you